<laughs> William, what are you doing? Everybody loves a little Sweet William in their garden. They sure do. So stay tuned for little Sweet William and Sweet Judy next on Garden Time. Sweet alyssum, sweet gums, or sweet williams. There is still a lot of sweetness in our gardens, even in the summertime. And you know, that could be even in the pots or outside the pot. And we have some sweet stories for you today. One of them is we're gonna be showing you some variety of olive trees that grow very well in our gardens here. We also are going to share a blackberry jam recipe. But coming up first, the tips of the month with Jan McNeilan. Well, I am standing here with Jan McNeilan again, and we're gonna be talking about our tips for this month, right? So okay. let's jump right in. Okay, well, the first thing we wanted to make sure and mention that OSU Extension has a food safety hotline. And it's actually that? statewide, and you can call the number, and you'll have it on the screen for us, um, and get tips on cooking, jelly making, what happens if my jelly failed and or how to um, or who to have test my uh, pressure canner they oh, wow. test the gauges um, all sorts of different things so anything to do with food preservation drying canning anything, so just a whole host of information everything that, if you're looking that you can for. call and get um, a master food preserver volunteer nice. to help you out wonderful Okay. And what else have we got going? Um, I want to talk a little bit about lawn clippings for those folks that actually apply like a weed and feed or weed killer on the lawn. Okay. Um, and if you compost to make sure that um, you don't compost those clippings at least two or three times, of two or three cuttings. So because you don't want any of that weed killer to get into your compost, which in then would uh, keep your plants from growing if you use the compost. Okay, so then after the two or three times, yeah, after then it's you're gone okay. from the system, then you're, you can't. You're okay. okay, but uh, that would be the best thing to do is okay. to make sure that you don't use that. Um, we have a list down here. Um, yellow jackets in the house. It does happen. It does. <laughs> it, it's just like one, you know, and it drives you crazy. And one day, I don't know why I did it, <laughs> but I saw this yellow jacket flying around and I thought, well, how do I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to whack at it because it's going to sting me. <laughs> so I got out my cooking spray. Well, I don't have to take the lid off and just went psh, at it and it dropped to the ground because it oiled the wings and it couldn't fly. Right. So at that point, I'm not sure what happens to it after that, but <laughs> you can take it outside if you want or dispatch it if you want. But it is a way to keep just, you know, one nuisance. You're not killing a whole nest, right, you're just right. killing one. And you're not using some chemical inside nothing, the house. Nothing, it's, it's, you know, you oil. may not want to spray it at your favorite painting or right. anything. But, uh, but <laughs> or that, family members. Yeah, really, that works uh, really well. The other thing we were talking about is what can you plant now? Yeah. Um, you can still plant lots of perennials in the yard as long as you keep them nice and watered throughout the summer. You, there are fall vegetables you can plant. You still have a little bit of time to plant, say, bush beans. Right. right um, yeah. But also kale and cabbage and broccoli and fall crops like that. Because this is the time of season when a lot of yeah. stuff is still workable. Yeah. Yeah. Good. You don't nice. want to plant anything. Lettuce is a little tricky just because with the heat it'll bolt. Right. Um, but otherwise, there's still a lot. And the OSU Extension has the the publication Growing Your Own, and in there tells you how, when you can plant what, and it'll give you an idea of what all the fall crops are. And this is, we need to pay attention to deadheading now too, don't we? Yeah, we do. I mean, do as much as you can, like rhododendrons. People worry about deadheading them, and I always say that in the Mount Hood National Forest, they aren't deadheading. So if you don't, right, you don't. Right. It's okay. Well, there you have it. That's our tips for this month. We'll be back again next month to talk to Jan again. Thank you, Jan. All right. See ya. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru. Your way on the parkway. They had to take the car, they had to get it open with the jaws of life, take me out on a backboard, took me to a Trauma One Center. I absolutely feel like the Subaru saved my life. Well, we, we trust Capital. We trust our salesperson here, Jackie. Jackie's great. 
I believe that she really cares about us. She teaches me about the Subaru. Our, Our way, way on, on the, the parkway. parkway. Deck it right the first time. I'm at Red Ridge Farms today with Paul Durant, and it's also Durant Vineyards and yep. Winery, so really lots going on up here. A lot going on. You know, we're the Oregon Olive Mill, Red Ridge Farms, Durant Vineyards, so just, you know, it's this has always been kind of a destination nursery, and certainly we kind of keep growing in that direction, so there's right. a lot going on on the property. And it's so much fun, you can buy plants here, which yep. I think is great. Yeah, and that was always the original focus of Red Ridge, was really all about, you know, especially plants, you know, and that's what kind of took us down the path of, uh, of these olive trees, which ah. has been great. And it has been, and I know we came up a couple years mm -hmm. ago seeing the orchards, and that was just so fantastic to see we can actually grow olives here yep. and have an industry. Yeah, yeah, and the industry's grown, I mean, from, you know, a few years ago when you, when you all were here, um, you know, there's now a growers association in Oregon, oh, and, you know, it's really started to really gain some traction, which is really exciting for us. You know, we've been at it for, this will be going into our 10th year of making olive oil here on the property, so to kind of see things really starting to take off has, has been great. Yeah, and so there has been some kind of downsides. Yep. There some bitten freezes. Yep. So, so what happened at that 13, 2013 So freeze? 2013, if people maybe recollect, uh, early December, you know, we had a cold snap that went on for about four or five days and was probably some of the harshest conditions that our trees have experienced. And our big planting um, down kind of lower elevation, we had four days at nine degrees, which is just, wow. you know, that's hard on anything. Sure, and, sure. Uh, but kind of through that, we lost, of course, you know, a fair number of trees, but you could look across that field and you could see these trees that were survivors. It looked great. And so, we're like, okay, now we know. We had kind of a little natural selection process happen there. <laughs> right, and so right. now we've started propagating our own trees off of those survivors. So, you know, previously we were primarily uh, bringing up trees out of, uh, from California out of, out of a wholesale nursery, you know, but now we're doing this ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is kind of an example of uh, some of the trees that we're propagating. You know, propagation techniques for olives, um, it's not easy, oh. but we're learning. <laughs> um, so it's getting better all the time. And so we focus really on kind of uh, three main survivors from that 2013, which was Pequal, which is a Spanish varietal, great olive oil, um, and a nice producer too, which is great. Not only does it seem to survive here well in Oregon, but it sets a good crop load. Um, and then the other ones are Frantoyo and Lachinos. Okay. Um, so those are the trees that we're propagating here on the, at the nursery. That is interesting. And so for a home gardener, how can we be successful in this? Well, so, you know, really I think when people look at, there's a couple ways to do it. Obviously you can grow, just grow them in a pot, a big pot. The mm -hmm. trees do great in that too. And you can, that way you can move it around. Um, you can, if it does look like a freeze has come in, you can maybe protect I'm the sure. tree a little mm -hmm. bit, just even just by putting it up against your house. Um, or if you want to plant them in your yard, you know, look for well-drained soils. You know, they like kind of the rocky, um, just kind of, you know, where soils, draining. where water's going to drain really well. Sure. And, uh, and they like to have high pH, you know, which oh. is a challenge in Oregon. Sure, sure. Um, so to sweeten up that soil a little bit when mm -hmm. you plant the trees is good. And then also, if you want to have some fruit, you know, obviously they're just beautiful ornamentals, but mm -hmm. uh, if you want to have a little bit of fruit to do whatever with, you need to plant two different varieties. So sure. like a Pequal with a Lachino or something like that to get some cross pollination. So, so yeah. pretty easy. Yep, I pretty mean, we, easy. We do fruit trees here, so it's yep. just a different, different, different crop. Different crop, yeah. exactly. So. Well, there's all kinds of things going on here, and just if you can just touch on what goes on in November for your big festival. Well, so, you know, this will be, I guess this will be our eighth or ninth year of uh, having this big olive oil festival, Olio Nuovo. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's the weekend before Thanksgiving every year. The property just becomes a giant open house. Mm -hmm. So we have wine tasting, uh, we have some food, and then, of course, it's really focused on the new oils that we're making, the Olio Nuovo. So, um, and those oils are so vibrant, they're special, you really can't get it anywhere else in the world world, mm -hmm. uh, you know, here in the States anyway. So it's, uh, it's really exciting. It is, it is. It is a great festival. We've been here many times to come in and taste that one because it is really interesting to taste them so fresh. Yep. So if you have any other questions, please go to Garden Time. We'll click you over their websites. But really, it's a great place to come any time of the year, but make sure that you put that on your calendar for November. Yep. Thanks so much, Paul. Uh, thank you.
So on this beautiful morning, I am actually standing out in front of what used to be the deck of the producers of the show, and they decided it was time to maybe redo it. And so I'm here with Josh, and Josh, which company are you from? Northwest Outdoor Living and Renovation. And so you might remember uh, recently, Judy had done a segment on going to a, a place and picking out the type of wood. We, she picked fiber on, right? Fiber on decking, yes. And, and so why, would, why? What's the purpose of that for so, us? So the benefit of choosing a product like fiber on is that it's a synthetic. There's no exposed wood fiber like the cedar deck that was here right. previously. So you're not going to have the, the mildew staining or the tendency to get the mildew staining on it. You're not going to get the... Um, as much of a propensity for algae growth on it. Yeah. It's not gonna have a 10 year shelf life like a typical cedar deck that we have today. And so once, once a homeowner says, okay, this is what I want to buy for my new deck, and they think I'm, I'm gonna jump right in there and just do this myself, um, I can tell you right now that knowing the producers for many years, I know they took care of this old wood deck. Absolutely. They sanded it. They, but it, you didn't find it was good underneath, did you? <laughs> For a 25-year deck, they got a great shelf life out of it. So, you know, pretty, that was pretty typical of cedar in the past. Old-growth cedar would, would have an average lifespan of between 20. If you really push it, I've seen it last 30 years, but 25 years is a pretty good life. So, And then when, when, they, when they decided not to go ahead and do it themselves and get some help, um, outside of not knowing what they thought the top was stable, but really often it is the underneath part that goes bad, isn't it? Yeah, it's a pretty pretty common misnomer. A lot of people look at the top surface of the deck and don't understand with the average wood deck, water's penetrating through the deck, it hits the floor joists, and then what te has a tendency to happen is, is the water's gonna sit underneath the deck. Yeah. And and so even though the top surface seems like it's in great shape, and, and of course that's what we're treating, that's what we're staining. Right. Um, you know, the average person is gonna take a look at that and think, oh, it's in great shape. We've only got one or two rotted boards. We could replace those right. and refinish it. <laughs> and what has a tendency to happen is, is you're seeing, you're seeing a small fraction of what's going on with the deck. So, and instance, you have seen this before, haven't you? Oh, when you go out, absolutely. people have all the best intentions, but then they get into it and it's, it almost always tends to be worse than what you think it's going to be. It's almost <laughs> always worse than what you think it's going to be. Absolutely. So Josh, your crew actually uh, came and, and, and tore this one out completely. Absolutely. But that's actually a good thing to do, isn't it? Because that helps with the reinstallation and what needs to be done. What allowing us to come out and tear the deck out did was allow us to get good eyes on the ground right now before we order the material package. So I know what we can do to put as much framework into the deck as possible. Um, a lot of people want to tear the deck out and, and if the a average homeowner you know, wants to jump in and do it, more power to them, great. That being said, by getting us out here, there's some things we were able to do, not because this is rocket science in any way, shape, or form, but because there's some tricks of the trade that we've learned over the years to make this go a lot more efficient, not only from a tear out and disposal standpoint, but also from a, um, taking care with the house, not damaging the siding, ensuring that we're gonna have everything prepped and ready to go for the new ledger board, um, seeing what kind of actual heights we have. In this case, you can see we've got a concrete patio that was coming off of the back of the house, right. which is fairly typical. Um, that's going to dictate what we do with, uh, with uh, post and beam, with the type of footings or blocking that we put in it. So it allows us to get a, a good um, understanding of what it's going to take to put the deck back together. Perfect. Well, you know, I, I'm a big fan of, of doing it myself. I get out there and I think I do it, but there's often times when I jump into a project myself, Josh, and I Absolutely. think, oh, I don't want to do this. So I get help, and you know, what we're going to do is, is we're going to uh, take a while longer, maybe a couple weeks. We're going to come back when they're actually installing the fiber on, and then you're going to see the whole thing going together and seeing how it's done. Josh, I really appreciate it. Thanks, Absolutely. man. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Garden Time is brought to you by Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. Hi, I'm Sarah with Portland Nursery, and I'd like to invite you to check out our website where you'll find valuable gardening information that you know is local to our area. Check out our gardening solutions page where you'll find over a hundred helpful brochures, or sign up for our email newsletter to receive timely gardening advice, inventory updates, and upcoming classes and events. Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. On 50th and Stark, 90th and Division. 
In the summer months, water use can double or triple due to outdoor watering. Here are three simple tips to help save water and money this summer. Set your sprinklers so that they're watering your lawn and plants and not the pavement. Water early in the morning or later in the evening when temperatures are cooler. Group plants with similar water, shade, and sun needs together. For more water conservation information and tips, check out the Regional Water Providers Consortium at www.conserveh2o.org. I have a yummy recipe today. I'm at Smithberry Barn with Joelle, and Joelle, we have just a little bit of a different kind of recipe. What is it? We are making a jam today, freezer jam, using honey and a special pectin that we sell here at Smithberry Barn, the Pomona's uh, Universal Pectin. Oh, how is it different? So it is a citrus-based pectin, it's all natural, and what it does it is allows you to use either no sugar wow. or less sugar. Um, it allows you to use sugar substitutes, and like today, we're going to be using honey. Nice, nice. And with everybody having different dietary needs, it's nice that you can have everyone can have jam. Exactly. Ah, so um, also about the berries. So we're using blackberries, but can we use other kind of varieties? You have so many here. We sure can. So today, we're mixing a couple of different kinds of blackberries. These are fresh from the farm this morning. Nice. So Joelle, how many different varieties of blackberries do you have here at the farm? We grow about, ooh, I have to count, six, <laughs> I would say about six varieties of blackberries. We um, have raspberries and strawberries and blueberries all throughout the year. So nice. you can pick something and make jam all season long from about mid-June to um, into August. And it's okay to mix them, which is really cool. Exactly. And so the nice thing about the pe Pomona's pectin is that it makes small batches of jam. Nice. So today we're using only four four cups of berries, which okay. is approximately, if you were to come out and buy them in this form, mm -hmm. you would have about two pints is all that you oh, need for okay. a batch of jam. So you can get creative with the different kinds that you mix together. You can try small batches and test out your different you know, preferences for sugar and nice. honey and different substitutes. So we right now have four cups of berries in this. We're all going right. to be adding some lemon juice. All right. Seems like an easy recipe, and do you exactly. want me to start mashing? You may start mashing while I get the honey prepared. All right. We are going to use a cup of honey. And I like my jam um, nice and chunky, so you can do it as much as your family likes, or you like how much mashing. Exactly. Okay, I'm going to put that in. All right. And I do like that you can really use different kind of sweeteners. That's really interesting with this um, pectin. And that seems like a lot of honey, which the idea with this pectin is that you actually, you could err on the side of caution, use a little bit less, mm -hmm. and then you taste it when you get to the point of, after you've added the pectin, and right before you're ready to pour it off into your jars, taste it, see if you like it, sure. and then you can add a little bit more. Okay, so I'm doing all the work here. What are you going to be doing? I'm going to be making the pectin mixture, oh, okay. which is boiling water. We have three quarters of a cup of boiling water. We're putting it in our mini food processor. Because it has to be blended. Exactly. And then we need three teaspoons of the pectin. And that's the package that it comes in, in the box, correct? Exactly, okay. yes. So Joelle, how long does it have to blend? This blends for about two minutes. Okay, so I'm going to finish mashing, and that's going to finish blending, and we'll be right back. So is that about two minutes? That has just about been two minutes. All right. So and the first thing step. that we're going to do is pour the pectin. Okay, so it's the hot pectin blended right into and the berries. And you can see how thick that is. That's one step in the thickening process. Okay. And then so will this be just like cooked? Is it going to be the same kind of consistency? It'll be a little bit, um, I would say a little less firm than a cooked jam. Right. The next step will be to add the calcium water, right. which this is the ingredient that is special and unique to the Pomona's pectin. This is a packet of white powder, calcium powder, mm -hmm. that we mixed um, with water. And this is what's going to help the sugar and the pectin gel okay. so you don't this is why you don't need the sugar because this is ah, what causes the gelling to right. happen so what you'll do is you'll test your gelling as you add the pectin and decide as you go if you need more or less yeah, of the pectin right. or the I'm sorry the calcium water well, what do you think 
I think it looks pretty good. I think okay. we should probably taste it. Okay. And then the calcium water, you can actually keep that in the fridge if you want to make another batch. It exactly. stays. Exactly. Here's some All right. for you. Oh, thank you. So the calcium water you put in your fridge, and then the batch, the Pomona's pectin will make two to four batches of jam, depending on how much of the pectin you end up using. So you'll save your calcium water, you'll save your packet of pectin, oh. and then later, or you know, later that day, the next day, a month from now, you can make more jam from other fruits. Mm. That's really tasty. Mm. It's really good. And it looks like a nice consistency. I would like to add one you more. Okay, well, you are the expert. <laughs> That's very flavorful. Mm hmm. Good berries. All right, and then we're ready to put it in the jars? Exactly. So we're doing freezer jam, but mm -hmm. we are still going to be putting them into jars. Okay. And we will just make sure we leave enough head space. All right. And just like regular jam, you want to clean these, sterilize them, boil the um, lids exactly. and the rings. You need to leave enough room at the top for expansion as it freezes. All right. And then they'll last for about a year in it your freezer. Wow. Yeah. That is nice. Okay. And the one thing that's different than regular jam is you don't have to worry about the seal because it's going exactly. in the freezer. Exactly. So that's kind of nice. If you ever had it fail, it's so disappointing when the um, other kind of jam fails. And the nice thing about this pectin as well is you may make the jam, and if you don't like the consistency, even after you know packaging it up, you can take it out and do it again oh, wow. and reseal it. That's more for if you're making a cooked version where mm. you can't tell the consistency right away. So. Right, right. Uh, well, you know, you can get all of these things out at Smith Berry Barn. You can get the pectin mix, you can get the berries, which are the most important thing, and talk to staff and really go home and make some freezer jam. It's really easy and so delicious for your family. Thanks. You always have the greatest, greatest recipes. Thank you. Welcome to Blooming Junction, where it's easy to connect with nature. At Blooming Junction, you'll find beautiful, healthy plants, good, fresh food, and a place to regain peace and calm in your life. We have an unsurpassed collection of unique and distinctive plants and the expertise to help any gardener be successful. And we feature Blooming Advantage plants. Come check out Blooming Junction for an inspiring experience in the garden or in the kitchen. Blooming Junction, offering quality plants for beautiful gardens. Standards prices are great. We've checked, they're very competitive. That's why we use them. You don't have to waste time running around making phone calls. It's good to know when working with Standard that our staff doesn't have to spend incredible amounts of time searching for pricing. And even with the clients that have checked around, they've always come back to Standard as being their best buy. Since 1947, we set the standard. Standard TV and appliance. It is outdoor entertaining season and I'm at Northwest Natural Appliance Center with Matthew. And Matthew, we love to be outside in Oregon, but sometimes the nights are a little cool, the shoulder seasons are a little cool, so you have some ideas for us to make that a little bit more comfortable. Yes, we do. We have natural gas fireplaces um, that can be built in. Um, they can be freestanding or they can just be built into a, a tiled wall or a stone wall. Um, very convenient. Really nice. Yeah, they put off heat um, so you can stand nice here, warm. warm the hands, um, sit by the hearth and you know have that nice cozy atmosphere. It is nice to entertain and have your friends and really be comfortable because we can be a little cool. And I know that um, having a gas fireplace is a little bit easier sometimes than having a wood one. It is. Um, this one, it turns on with a flip of the switch. You can add remote controls to it. Um, the nice thing is there is no smoke coming from it. Nice. And it's just the convenience not having to carry wood and 
um, or chop the wood. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and I know some people like a freestanding or a wall unit, but you have some other ones that maybe everyone can sit around. So let's go see those. Yes. Um, we have the, the fire balls. Um, they come in different sizes. They can um, be a, a standalone um, off, you know, on the deck, so they are zero clearance um, to the bottom of them. Um, they come either with lava rock or glass. You get to Those choose um, what you put in there. Um, the stainless steel burner um, will last quite a long time. So Matthew, how do they operate? Is it pretty easy? It is. Um, these are plumbed with natural gas, so they run a gas line underneath it. Um, this particular model is a match light, so you turn the gas valve on, light your match, and you've got flame. And how easy is it to get a gas line? I don't have one in my backyard. Yeah, so we send contractors out there to look at the situation. Um, if they can get natural gas to it, they, they'll go sometimes underground or underneath the deck. Um, but in some cases, when they can't do that, they'll run propane. Oh. Um, and we do have ways to hide the propane tank. Um, the table that is <laughs> beside you there is a pro propane tank cover or it's there to, to hide the propane tank. That is very clever. And then what about winter care? What should we do? Um, I do recommend that you cover it up. There are vinyl covers that go over these um, just to keep it from the moss growing um, and having to clean it um, in the springtime. Sure, for so, leaves yeah. or needles or anything, so it really keeps it keeps it well. It does, yes. And the burners, they are stainless steel, so they're going to last. They're not a galvanized burner, um, so the longevity of it is, is there um, with the 304 stainless. Oh, perfect. And you have one more set that we're going to see. Let's go over there. Okay. Matthew, these are very beautiful. So how are they different from some of the other ones we might see? So these are fire pit tables. Um, these are for sitting around, entertaining with uh, having drinks, having a place to put it, um, as well as you know eating. Um, these can be full tables because they do come with covers to cover up the burner so that you have a, a full dining table. Oh, that is nice. And then what about for gas and propane too? Uh, they're for both. Um, just with the switch of an or orifice, uh, it will convert it from pro propane to natural gas. Uh -huh. Well, we've seen so many different styles here. So if you're interested in maybe extending the space that you can entertain in, in your garden or in your home, please go to gardentime.tv. We'll click over their website and you can come out, to, um, find out the information to come on down to the Appliance Center. Talk to Matthew and the staff here and get all the information. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming. Judy and I wanted to thank you all for spending time with us today. And what are you doing, Judy? William, I just want a little bit of Sweet William for my garden. You know, you can find Sweet <laughs> Williams oh, and a true. host of other plants <laughs> in every garden center. And for more information about today's show or any other show, please go to gardentime.tv. Thanks so much for spending time with us today. And we do look forward to doing it all again next week, right here on Garden Time. Judy, yep. do you remember when I asked you if you liked me? I mean, if you really liked me? Yeah, I liked you on Facebook. Yeah, well, I need you to do that again. Well, we really need everyone to like the new Facebook page for Garden Time. So you just go to gardentime.tv and click on the Facebook icon and like us again for our brand new page. The proceeding was a paid program of the Gustin Creative Group and its sponsors.